Welcome to the 71st Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Edward Shurek from Stony Brook University. He got his PhD from Botka University, uh, Botka Institute of Nuclear Physics in Novosibirsk. Uh, after getting PhD, he uh, became junior uh, uh, scientist at the same institute and an associate professor at the physics department of Novosibirsk University. He moved to Stony Brook in 1990, and where he is a professor since then. He is the director of the Center for Nuclear Theory since 93 and a distinguished professor since 2004. Um, <clears throat> he uh, has uh, uh, won numerous awards and honors over the years. Uh, in 96, he became fellow of the American Physical Society. He received the Iraq Medal in 2004, Alexander von Humboldt Prize in 2005, and he uh, received APS Herman Feshbach Prize uh, from the American Physical Society in 2018. Over the years, he uh, served in many capacities for the community. He used to be editorial uh, on the editorial board of Physical Review C, uh, served on the Physics Advisory Committee of Brookhaven, National Committee at INT in Seattle, um, Nuclear Science Advisory Committee, NSF DOE National Committee. And uh, he has very wide uh, research interests. He studied coagulant plasma. Actually, he coined the term coagulant plasma. He studied uh, relativistic carrier and collisions, physics of quantum chromodynamics, theory of super dense matter, color superconductivity instant tones in QCD, critical point, uh, some roles in QCD, and many other topics that I'm probably forgetting to mention. And today he will be talking about some classical theory of QCD phase transitions. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Edward. Okay, thank you, Igor, for introduction. Uh, th there is only one thing uh, in, in it that since December last year, I'm no longer director of the center, Dimo Davis. I feel much better uh, not being responsible for, for anything. Now, uh, I make my title slightly longer. It is now like a statement, and uh, I will explain it, of course. On the right, you see this hedgehog that's from hedgehog configuration. Uh, we kind of keep it as an official symbol of our group. And uh, on the left are my collaborators, uh, and particularly last two papers, which I will be describing, done by Dallas De Martini, who is my current student. And I mentioned especially he will look for a job in next cycle. So have a look at that. Oops. Yes. So I start very generally, give introduction of different form of gauge topology. And then I remind what is vacuum expectation value and just so-called Polyakov line. And that leads to this instant dance, which is a particular uh, object on which I concentrate today. And it has uh, like the parents instant on zero at zero mode, but it is much more interestingly uh, placed and uh, but even before fermions we have the confinement transition which we will be discussing uh, then there were some deformation uh, of QCD which moves around the confinement transition then there is chiral symmetry breaking I will explain how we look for it where we find it and there is another deformation of QCD via quark periodicity phases, which move around chiral transition. So in principle, the fact that two transitions in actual QCD are close uh, is kind of coincidence. We can move one and the other very smooth, smooth. And if I will have time at the end, I will explain the so-called Poisson duality, which exist between two languages. This instant Dian is semi-classical language and the monopole language, which is not semi-classical. But if you correctly calculate a partition function in both languages, you're supposed to get the same answer. Okay. What is wrong with this? Yes. 
Okay, so this is my map of different uh, topological objects. And uh, I start from the left. So this uh, light blue part relate to confinement. At the very beginning, people consider central vortices, which are some objects. If they pierce the Wilson loop, the phase which you get around is minus is pi, or contribution is minus one, and that gives Wilson law. Now, if you have two center vortices uh, merged together, uh, you get pi and pi getting two pi, and the vertex with two pi is invisible Dirac string. So the objects who are ends of Dirac strings must be monopoles. So yes, lattice people find monopoles in uh, gauge configurations and uh, find out that they behave like particles, and in particular, they both condense at TC. So confinement is both a condensation of monopoles, as uh, was proposed in the 70s. If we jump to the right side, the yellow side, uh, here we have instantons. Instantons are solutions of one equation in Euclidean time, and they correspond to some maxima in partition function over the configurations. So they're by basis of semi-classical theory. The instantons have uh, zero modes for quarks. So that generate make each instanton into effective operator called Paul Lagrangian. For example, if you have up and down quarks, you have this four Fermi effective vertex where quarks change chirality from left to right. That violate some part of chiral symmetry right there. And that play, that interaction play a big role in uh, vacuum physics. It explain chiral symmetry break and pions and many other things. But they don't explain confinement because instantons have only topological charge. I will explain later on. Now, at finite temperature, when there is this Polyakov line, and the Polyakov line, if it is not equal to one, means that there is some non-zero value of A naught present in the lattice configuration. So looking for instantons which at large distances do not go to zero field, but go instead to this Polyakov field, uh, led uh, people to discover these constituents and uh, instant dyes. These are this green circle. Now it is important that uh, they have fractional uh, topological charge and action they are self-dual, but they are fractional. And this fraction are not one over NC. It is absolutely any fraction. So that the sum of the three make one. And the way how it avoided the theorem of quantization of topological charges because they are connected with the rock string. Well, the theorem requires that they are not connected to any. So what, so this is green objects is a subject of what I will discuss. I will discuss, uh, ensembles of these objects. And depending on, the, on different fermions settings, uh, some of these objects will become the stoffed effective operators. In the case when they become effective operators of B fermion type, uh, they trivially violate uh, chiral symmetry and get a condensate, a coin density. So that is the case which Mitad wants to study. If they make any other operator, this is the case which we do not want to study, but I do. Okay, now about Poisson duality. It turns out in some cases that people were able to show that if you can construct partition function uh, in terms of monopoles or in terms of dions, you get the same answer. So I will explain it again. Everything is in this book, which this summer appeared. So I just make an ad for it. Now, long stuff about instant, uh, old stuff about instantons. The horizontal line is Chen Simon's number. When Chen, uh, what is plotted is energy and more precisely it's en minimal energy configurations well, for corresponding Chen Simon's number. When the number is zero, the, it is pure gauge topologically different, but pure gauges. So the energy is zero. These are called valleys. They're separated by mountains. And in fact, we have for all these configurations, we have 
analytic result for pure gauge. I will not describe them. And the only thing I'm telling you is that this uh, guy sitting on the top of a mountain is called Spaleron. And uh, it is unstable. It can roll down the, and it's called Spaleron explosion. For that also there is analytic solution and numerical, of course. And in principle, one interesting thing, which is now discussed at LHC at uh, RIG, whether we can isolate PP collisions, diffractive collisions in particular, when we produce exactly one sphaleron. So sphaleron has topological uh, number and it produces certain uh, chirality in QCD, but in electrolytic here it produces baryons. But this is not subject of today's talk. Another historic introduction is this. Uh, 60 years ago this year, Nambu Yonolazine started non perturbative physics, so to say, because they postulated that there are four fermion operators like this. This pi and sigma are defined here. This is four fermion operators. And uh, basically, they concluded that if this coupling constant G is sufficiently large, it creates a gap on the Dirac C which they call also constituent quark mass, or we call it constituent quark mass. In 61, there was no quarks yet. Uh, it is like gap in superconductors, but in superconductors that create that is created in weak coupling. And in, uh, in this field theory formulation, in this NGL model, if only appears if G is large enough, then the gap equation has no trivial solution. Now in 70s, uh, Bilarin, Polyakov, Schwartz, and Tupkin discovered the instanton solution. Toft discovered this effective vertex. Here it is shown with uh, uh, free light quarks. But if you forget strangeness, they are four Fermi operator. And this four Fermi operator actually have a form written here. The first two terms are the same terms as Nambu and made. There are four fields, three pions and sigma, and they are rotated into each other by chiral symmetry. So it's chiral symmetric, but it has two more fields, isovector scalar and pseudoscalar isoscalar, eta prime, the famous eta prime. And they appear, they also rotated among themselves on the uh, SV2 chiral symmetry, but U1 chiral symmetry is broken. This minus is telling us that there is repulsion in this channels and attraction in this channel. So many people, uh, Toft in particular himself, start discussing uh, that uh, th this interaction solved Mr. Elita Prime, why it is so heavy, not like Prime, which is of course correct. And, but the fact that the attractive interaction, I think is more important than repulsive interaction as usual, and that create Carl symmetry break. Now I came up with this little model in which have two parameters, the density of instantons and size, typical size. They kind of correspond to two parameters of NGL model. Uh, the density is like coupling and the size relates to cutoff lambda, which it had, but it has uh, some form factors, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this model uh, also explain chiral symmetry breaking, many other things. The interac interacting ensemble of instantons was worked out in the 90s. Now, lattice have shown deep cooling and they show this type of uh, distribution of topological charge. So it, uh, at least qualitatively correspond to these ideas. And uh, another important thing which I want to mention is this diquark formation. So in the other channel of two quarks, uh, the same soft vertex generate diquarks. Uh, and uh, this is roughly speaking how a pion look like that uh, U and G quarks go for sequence of tunneling. And in each tunneling, if you look, the chirality is tricky. This is a picture of a nucleon where you can get diquarks. If you have delta, for example, there is no, uh, no such vertices possible. And uh, that's one interesting thing. The other is color superconductivity, no time for that. I want to show this cute decay showing instantons at work. So if you have eta C, which goes to two gluons, GG duo, because pseudoscalar, 
JJ dual is coupled to the instanton, instant is coupled to u bar u d bar d s bar s. And it was noticed this particular free large decades that was noticed by BJ uh, very, very famously. And other free particle decays are absent. And the typical multiplicity is uh, five or six. So it is, uh, and there were paper of Thomas Schaffer and his then student who worked out on this decay quantitative distribution of the channels and things like this. Uh, there are many, many papers. I mentioned two. One paper is by myself two years ago, now three years ago. Uh, and uh, this is about uh, light front wave functions, so meson, baryons, pentaquarks, etc. And I'm particularly calculated a uh, five quark tail of a uh, baryon wave function and the distribution of anti U and anti Ds. And that explains why we have significantly larger anti-Ds than anti-Us. And uh, that is also due to uh, top vertex. Now, another paper is with Ismail Zahed about mesonic bone factors, basically. So now I go to instant diets. Instant diets are, first I need to explain what the polycov line. So polycov line, is periodic and just the line goes like this because time is periodic. It's uh, integral like this over closed circle because it's always closed circle. It's called holonomy or it's gauge invariant integral. Now, uh, if you have a finite temperature lattice, you can calculate average value of this thing because exponent is a product of lattice links is unitary matrix. The unitary mat product of unitary matrix is unitary matrix. So it has um, some eigenvalues and these eigenvalues are arranged as a points on a circle. It would be convenient. So here are lattice data and temperature measurement of this wave, this L. On the left here is pure gauge theory. We see that at high temperature it becomes one and then it decreases. Now, this quantity is related to free energy of a single quark. If free energy of a single quark is infinite, the left-hand side is zero. That's a confinement to the left of Tc. And if it is finite, like for this point, that means that uh, one quark has finite free energy. And so it is deconfined. Now in pure gauge theory, it's first of the transition with this jump from zero to 0 0.4, you will see it later. With light quarks, uh, it start getting to the left, a tail, this tail, roughly from 0.4 down. So it never become real zero, but become small. So this tells us that in QCD, we have crossover transition without real, real transition. So I hope everybody knows that. In the end of uh, last century, let me say, uh, Pierre Van Baal with his student and also Li and Lu from holographic point of view, discovered that when you are looking for instant on solution with asymptotics equal to this non-trivial polycov line, you actually get it split into objects and these objects are monopoly as we just discussed. There are many papers uh, around this thing, uh, including, uh, by the way, method and collaborators about some of the phase, which we shall talk later. But uh, the thing uh, which I want to start with is how it looks like on the lattice. So normally on the lattice, if you do so-called deep cooling, minimizing the action, uh, you go from a picture like this to a picture like that, where you start seeing individual instantons. You don't see uh, the absolute uh, magnitude of the action. I'm telling you that here it is about three orders of magnitude larger than here. So there are a lot of thermal gluons, et cetera, et cetera, which all disappear in the cooling. And then you see this in the line curvature. And in this deep cooling calculations, you have instantons and anti-instantons. Each bump is self-dual and action 
and topological charges are plus minus one. However, uh, uh, Jürgen Fritz and Lumfield, they uh, invented constraint cooling, which is some algorithm which uh, minimize action by keeping Polyakov, local Polyakov uh, value intact. And they have seen a different picture. The picture look similar. However, these objects now have fractional topological charge. So that was, I think, the first. Uh, it, it is 2010. So, like 11 years ago, and that was the first seeing of these diamonds on the lattice by this method. We will use another method. So, I should say that uh, Gottinger, Lindenfrieds, and some uh, group in Russia uh, were doing a lot of work looking for the subject on the lattice. I show our results, so look at this picture. Uh, and uh, this is based on QCD configurations, which are realistic cloud masses and temperature slightly above TC. And uh, it is very clean cases because it was done with the main wall fermions. And furthermore, uh, for this Dirac operator, we used even better overlap fermions, which have exact chiral symmetry. So uh, if we select, for example, configuration with topological charge one, it has exactly one Fermionic zero mode and we can look how it looks like. So if you look at this picture, you will see uh, some peaks of three different colors. Uh, they correspond to three different periodicity of quarks chosen in such a way that you see one type of a dion, the other type of a dion, the third type of a dion, which are shown by these three colors. So you see that indeed there are rather uh, randomly placed uh, objects which have these peaks in space. If you take an isolated object and make it a shape, this is a shape of its Dirac density of Dirac zero mode. So this is logarithm of the density. This black line is the shape we get. So you see this is orders of magnitude. And the blue line is the analytic shape of solution of the Dirac equation in the field of one dial semi-classical. So topology tell you that uh, if Q is one, there should be one zero mode. It doesn't tell you that the shape of this object should be exactly semi-classical. In other words, I'm saying thousands of gluons which sit on top of these uh, structures do not affect at all the shape of the zero mode or quasi zero modes. That's one statement. The other, st and we don't quite understand why is it that uh, this topological, uh, not only topological number, the number of zero modes, but the shape of each solution is preserved very well. The other thing is that sometimes these objects overlap and then overlap significantly. If they don't overlap, then there is no dependence on Kof coordinate on Euclidean time. If they do overlap, there is interference and it may have shapes like this. Now, again, we detected these shapes compared to results from analytic formulas from Pierre, and they agree extremely well. So I'm saying that uh, with a fermionic filter, we directly see on the lattice these objects. Whether they are overlapping or not, they're semi-classical. Now we try to do ensemble of them. Of course, at the beginning, people did uh, mean field, etc. I will not describe it. Uh, but I first start from the simplest group, SU2. In SU2, you have matrices two by two, of course, and you have two values, which I would call mu and minus mu here. In general, we have NC of them. There is also mu's. Mu's are difference of mu's. So if mu's are located here, mu one and mu two are the segments, this one and this one. And some of the segments are defined in such a way that some of the mu's is one. They defined actions of this instant on diodes. 
So a pi squared over g squared is the action of the instant on the whole circle. And each type of a dime corresponds to segment on the circle with this new. Some of the news is one. So all three, all two in SU2, three in SU3, and so on. Dines together have action on the instanton. Action of the instanton can also be written with in one loop approximation. It's a logarithm of temperature. So at high temperature, the action of the instant is large. E minus S is suppressed, and you have small number of them. When you go to lower temperature, uh, the coupling become larger. These objects appear and they start affecting uh, the system. What is happening? Okay, I need to push. This is one of the first uh, uh, numerical calculation of ensemble of these diodes. I don't uh, spend time on. Uh, describing the interaction. This is rather technical issue. Uh, but the main thing is that uh, each, uh, each of them is just characterized by location. And you have, uh, in SU2 case, you have 2L and 2M. We call them four species of dyes. Each pair have different interactions, but... Uh, okay, so the main thing without dyes, known from 1980, there is, but with non-zero Polyakov line, there is so-called gross pisarsky yaffa effective action. And this effective action is such that it disfavors confinement and has minimum at mu equals zero. So mu is this parameter. At mu equals zero, we have no field A. One can play it uh, with uh, different theories, in particular uh, supersymmetric theories, et cetera other theories of the joint. That is what uh, in particular is done by new type of collaborators. Uh, however, in uh, QCD, uh, it is very simple. You have, if you have this uh, non-zero Polyakov line, it generates uh, masses to some gluons and quarks. And uh, this masses are positive, etc. So the system, this favors this. It favors trivial fields. However, if you add uh, these dions, the situation change. They directly interact with uh, uh, Polyakov line. So if you have very sm uh, small density of uh, these dions, for example, this round line, the effective uh, potential, which we calculate, has this shape. And there is a minimum here at relatively small value. Now, if you increase density to, for example, this green one, uh, slowly the two minima merge and they merge at mu equal a half. So mu equal a half correspond to symmetric situation when uh, both types of dion have the same action, symmetric, and this is a confining situation. So this transition show very smooth transition of the confinement in the situ uh, This is more recent paper uh, just published it has SU3, so you have three dions, and it have, if there are three dots like this, there are three actions proportional to segments. And the effective action look like this. So this red is a critical value of density, in which case the two minima are equal. One minimum correspond to mu one third. One third means that all three would be the same. And that is confining phase, and this is the confined phase. And in this case, as you can see, you have first order transition from here to here. If we plot it versus Polyakov line, we see that it is zero up to some temperature and then it jumps to this point four and goes up. So blue are our results and red are lattice results. So they are very close. I wouldn't go into details. Now there is uh, people propose the formation of the theory by adding some polynomials in a Polyakov line, which uh, suppress basically a Polyakov line and help confinement. So uh, that was studied on the lattice, of course, and uh, this is studied in uh, our setting. 
So if you increase this coupling H, which is a coupling of that operator, it suppress the Polyakov line. One effect of it is that uh, the confinement temperature goes up. So confining phase increases. And the other is that this jump become very small. And on the lattice, uh, Marcin Madelia was able to see that there is confining phase, then there is the confined phase, and then there is a reconfined phase when it returns back. We don't really see that, but there are only hint. Anyway, uh, this results kind of uh, nicely correspond to what you see on the lattice. Now, here you see topological susceptibility. The blue points are ours. The other are from lattice. So you see first order jump in topology. But if you, this is at h equals zero, that's ordinary non-deformed PCD uh, gauge theory. And this is the formed one at large h. So it has a smooth transition and it is, uh, we don't see uh, for this large h any uh, the confinement transition anymore. Quick now question, I, what's the meaning of this deformation? The meaning is it's just you add some uh, operator which suppress polyacol line, yes? You, uh, you want to study whether you can have some external handle uh, which would affect a knot, yes? And yes, it works and it creates some interesting dependence. It's, it's external handle which you can deform QCD and see, see what happens, yes? It's not just really like a source hand. put by hand. It's a put by hand, and people studied what happened with it, and we also studied what happened with it, and we see the same thing. Yes, I'm just emphasized that by this handle you can move around the confinement transition, and then I will have another deformation with another handle on chiral transition, and so playing with two handles, I can uh, move it wherever I want, basically. Okay. Because it is something to connect strong coupling confinement phase to a weak coupling confinement phase. So with the deformation, yes. small S1 becomes confining. Yes, but, yeah. but I can move differentially so a little bit. Yes, not, not just in infinity as you said, yeah. yeah. Okay, quarks. So quarks have zero mode and for one quark flavor, each uh, dion which have toft operator have Q bar Q, so it's a meet and absorb quark and anti-quark. And the fermionic determinant can be viewed as a sum of a diagrams when each of them is visited by a quark. However, depending on density, you can have either determinant dominated by these pairs of molecules, in which case Dirac spectrum look like this, and it doesn't have very small eigenvalues, or it can be dominated by very long quark travel long paths. And because of length of this part, it gets small Dirac eigenvalues. And it has spectrum like this. And in the limit volume to infinity, it will extend all the way to zero. And according to this famous formula, you get quark condensate from density of eigenvalues at zero lambda. Lambda is eigenvalue. So, now, how we extract the uh, chiral symmetry breaking, I'll show you on this example. This is SU3. This is a paper just submitted. So here you see, for example, histograms of Dirac eigenvalues for three system size, 120 diodes, 240, and 360. Now, yellow is the small one, and it has this deep and no eigenvalues below this point O2. Why? Because of course, if you have finite system, you cannot have infinite, uh, infinitely long path. So this is finite size effect. I'm saying if, if I first look at this line, I get a gap of this magnitude. If I look at this one, so the larger is the system, the smaller is the gap. And you do infinite volume limit. If the gap is exactly one over uh, V, Nothing is left, and uh, these gaps are shown here by these red points. And what they tell you is that for all these temperatures, the gap is actually zero. What you observe is just final size effect. Now, if you 
don't feed this region of this final size gift, but look at the other part, you linearly extrapolate it like shown here. And that would be extrapolation would give you Q bar Q. You see they are more or less the same for all three volumes. And these are the blue dots. They're corrected to final size effect because they have three volumes. So this is a condensate. And then you see that here it goes to zero. And here the gap actually become non-zero. So somewhere in this region, we have chiral transition. Okay, now the formation, which uh, I want to explain. Suppose you have a theory with five colors and five layers. Uh, and because you have five colors, you have five mu's in the polycode line. So let's say they correspond to these five uh, red dots. Then we have five dions and their actions uh, or masses are equal to proportional to five segments. Uh, the question is which of these five guys will have fermionic zero mode? The answer to that question was given by Pierre Van Bau already, and it was very simple. So the blue, light, the blue dots show the periodicity of a fermion when you go around Matsubara cycle. If you have a fermion, the phase is pi. It's a fermion and change sign, yes? So the blue dots sit at pi. Now, the answer from here is the correct zero mode, the normalizable zero mode would be for this dion on which segment the blue point sit. So in this case, we have five, uh, quarks, all of them are fermions, and all of them have zero modes with one dion, this, this one. And we'll have effective top to operator, which would be 10 fermion operator. All other guys do not interact with quarks. They do not have zero modes. That would be the answer for ordinary QCD in this particular setting. Why does it Okay. Now there is this uh, Japanese colleagues some years ago, now nearly 10 years ago, proposed another QCD called Z and symmetric QCD. This is a theory in which our flavors, five flavors, each have different periodicity. So this guy is a fermion, it has pi. Other guys are not fermions and not bosons. They have a particular phase when they go around the cycle. So what you see here is that each segment has one blue dot. So each type of a dion has one uh, quark pair or Q bar Q interacting. This is the uh, limit which uh, Nita mentioned. In this case, we have five soft operators, each of them of Q bar Q type. And in this case, uh, chiral symmetry is always broken and it's just proportional to density. So at any density, there is chiral symmetry broken. Now here are results of our simulations for these two theories, ordinary QCD and this Z2 QCD. Let me start from right hand side. This is Polyakov line. The blue dots are value of polycode line in this interval. This S again is log of T. High temperatures in the right, small temperatures in the left. And you see there are some points going like here. You don't see any phase transition. If you look very, very closely, you have inflection point and then it goes up and then a little bit down. So somewhere here is inflection point. That's the confinement in ordinary to color QCD. with two quarks, two color, two flavor. Now, red points here is the Z2 QCD. Here it behaves the same way. Then there is a jump and there are these points. So uh, we see that the confinement transition completely changes. It changes from smooth crossover to strong first order. Sitting more or less at the same place, but change order and become much stronger. Let's see what happened with chiral transition. Here is blue points 
they correspond to the ordinary procedure. You see very ordinary behavior. There is a Q bar Q, then it goes down, and then it remains zero. So somewhere here, there is a chiral transition. If you go to this theory, Z2 QCD, the first thing we found, which surprised us, the quark condensate increased by significant factor, like factor five, for the same density, for the same temperature. And then there are two phases, but these two phases are not two different chiral phase transition in some sense. Here is symmetric phase when up and down quarks, of which one of them is fermion, the other is boson, have the same condensate. And then above this point, they have different condensate. Yet these lines, these points do not go down. So there is no chiral restoration. It remains all the way to infinity. And this is what I explained on the previous transparency that even at any density of the ions, this setting, this setting will get chiral symmetry back. So this is uh, my second definition. I skip this for, for reason of time and go to my, I have about 10 minutes, I think. Yeah? That's fine. Yes, and I can explain this issue. Uh, the idea of this Poisson duality was due to Nick Dory and Parnachok, and the year was 20 years ago. But that paper was a very important paper, not noticed uh, very much, unfortunately. They were doing it in uh, N equal four super n mills on this setting when you compactify time into a circle but you keep supersymmetry. This is some setting uh, which uh, has advantages. And, uh, but why do you need extend, uh, ex uh, extensive supersymmetry? Because in order to have some classical monopoles, in order to have top polycoop solution, you need a joint scalar. So the usual super mills, for example, do not have it. And N equal four has six scalars and you have these monopoles. So you have semi-classical monopoles in this theory. And you have also this, what I call instant dions. And, and you can calculate partition function in terms of monopoles and in terms of dions. They look very different. I will not show you this derivation or even the results. They were not able to sum it till the end but they noticed that one formula and the other formula are related by so-called Poisson summation form. So they call it Poisson duality. So it was not Poisson who noticed this duality, but uh, with the help of some mathematical formula, you can see that you derive the same thing. I will explain it in much simpler example, which comes from paper with my then student, Adit Ramamurti and Ismail Zahed. So it turned out that you can uh, have the same situation for very simple systems. For example, you have a quantum particle on a circle with also some Ronald bond phase acting on. So one way, and I call it Hamiltonian versus Lagrangian. Hamilton approach is a very standard. So if a particle rotates, there are angular momentum, integer L, energy is L squared over two lambda, lambda is moment of inertia. So there is a Boltzmann factor, of course, sum over lambda, sum over L, sorry. And then if you have a Ronald bond phase, you get this I L omega, because it makes this L, L circle. So this is partition function number one, Hamiltonian one, I would call. The other one is Lagrangian. Lagrangian means that you do in terms of winding along Matsubara time. So this is my trajectories. Alpha, alpha is the angle in the circle, is proportional to tau, and it rotates n times. This beta is the length of Matsubara circle. So one over beta is temperature, and it appears here. So now you see this is partition function number two. Notice that uh, this one have temperature downstairs as normally in Boltzmann factor. And therefore at low temperature, it's well convergent at high temperature, no, because of excited states. Here temperature is upstairs. 
So this one is good at high temperature. Here, omega, each term appear with integer in exponent. So it explicitly periodic function of omega each term. Here, omega appears like this. And only after you sum over all n, it become periodic function of omega. Nevertheless, this and this can be summed up and they're equal and they give this Jacobi function free. What is funny about it that if you put this sum into Mathematica and this sum into Mathematica, it, it sums it up and both of them in terms of this theta free function, however, different formulas. In order to prove that these two formulas are the same, you need to use again Poisson formula. <laughs> so it is Poisson duality in some sense, yes? Now, of course, you can plot the result, this one, this one, or this one, and it shows the same thing. This is for different temperatures as a function of omega. And uh, there's no question that uh, these are two approaches. You, so in other words, you shouldn't use this language plus this language. It is either this or that. A no. quick question about the previous slide. Um, you had a pre-exponential factor with the square root in the second Z2. Yes. Because Is that appearing automatically or you put it- It's, it's uh, appeared automatically. It's semi-classical determinant, yes. Okay. Uh, of, for these paths, yes. I, I just keep a little bit of technicality, yes. Okay. The formula in, in this uh, Dory case, much more complicated with some integrals, etc. but it is basically the same idea. So here is this famous Poisson formula, which I show you the first time. So if you have sum over integers of some arbitrary function f, it is equal to sum of this, where f tilde is a Fourier transform of function f. So if this function is Gaussian, its Fourier transform is also periodic Gaussian. And that was the case in my example, and it was also the case in uh, Dory Parnachev paper. So it was Gaussian and Gaussian, so to say. However, if we do QCD instant on dyons, we get action like this, and we have sum like this. And this is modulus, not square. So it's a different function. However, Poisson tell me that I can use this formula for any function f. So I can calculate Fourier transform of this function and rewrite this z in this form. I call it monopole form. It has a different q. It has iq omega now instead of omega here, and it has s of q, which is this. What does it mean? Yes. First of all, what is this integer q? What the meaning of it? The meaning is uh, actually uh, known for a long time. This is Tony Z and uh, Julia had paper. So you see monopole is magnetic object. If, um, if it doesn't move, it has only magnetic field. If it start moving, it get electric field. If it start rotating around itself, the rotating monopoles obtain electric charge. This Q is electric charge. So you have monopoles who are rotating around themselves. And this Q is either angular momentum, you may call it, or electric charge. And this is action of the monopole. Now, this formula actually is full of meaning and it's extremely important. Yes, when I first saw it, I jumped. So what does it tell you? It tells you that this monopole partition function has action at weak coupling, small g, this is large and log of it is large, so it becomes large. But it is not one over g squared. It's log of one over g squared. So normally, if I look here, if I have action of classical semi-classical object, it should be number divided by g squared. One over g squared for asymptotic freedom formula become log t. Exponent and log kill each other, and we get inverse power of temperature. The instant density, instant density are all inverse power of temperature. Now, if this monopoles have this, that means that exponent of minus s would be power of log. 
And indeed, this is what lattice were telling us for a long time. These are lattice guys. This is density of monopoles. And it is fitted by power of log. And furthermore, the power is integer. And if you plug in the previous formula from previous page, you explain it. So what it all tell us? It tell us that QCD monopoles are not semi-classical logic. They cannot be found as solution of young man's equation because in this case, there would be this. You can find them on the lattice. They have properties of a particle, but you cannot have them as classical solution. Yet we do have monopole partition function in this form. So we don't have configuration. We don't have classical configuration, but we do have uh, this um, monopole part form of partition function. And yes, the sum of this equal the sum of that. Question here. Good. Go ahead. OK. Um, Edward, please, this time, do not yell at me, OK? Yes. This construction is completely. Let's ask a new question then. Yes. This construction is completely in Euclidean space. Because you go to Euclidean space, you do not lose I. I is there by minimal coupling. Q is electric charge. Omega is gauge field. Okay. You do a sum over electric charges there. So this has fixed magnetic charge and you sum over the tower of the electric charges. Okay. Yes. On the right hand side, you have summation over winding number. So yeah, this yes. winding number versus electric charge, they are not mutually, they, they are in some sense dual to each other. So the, yes, there is this, this object. Poisson dual, yes. Yeah, Poisson dual. There is this object which has genuinely magnetic charge, genuine electric charge. And because you put it on the circle, it's mass times the circle size becomes action. So then this object is genuinely a dion instanton. But the object on the right hand side of the summation, it is characterized by winding numbers and magnetic charge, period. Yes. And there yes. is already a dion in the story. I am I am not try I am not hung up to this issue at all. You know, I am trying to bring some clarity to the discussion. That's all I am trying to do. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I agree that yeah, so of course. The way how they are both written are Euclidean, yes, you're saying. Yes. yes. So going to Euclidean space does not take away an I or anything like that. That is, I think, that statement you made is not correct. I is still there. It is I, Q, A4, whatever it is. Okay. Well, okay. It, it is. Uh, I'm saying that because of Poisson formula, uh, one function f is this, the exponent. Good. And the f tilde is its uh, uh, Fourier transform, right? So I write it this form, yes? Right. So this z equal that z. Right. Now the question is whether we give its meaning uh, of monopoles. Of course, yeah, I cannot prove that this is a sum of a monopoles because I don't have configurations. I cannot calculate the Z mono directly. No, there is a, you know, this whole thing multiplies the monopole operator exponential I sigma, okay? It has magnetic charge one and it is a sum over electric tower. Yes. And the right hand side is sum over winding power. If you are at very large circle, it is good to use this Dionic description, but uh, you know, this electric tower of the thion. But if you are at very small circle, you are supposed to use this. You can take just winding number so, one yes. or something yes. like that. And it has just one magnetic charge. And, and it is more efficient to use this monopole instant. On yeah, I, I fully agree with you. This is all I am saying. Yes. Yeah, so it is, it okay. is the same. Well, OK. I now again have my problem. So it is it is like here indeed. That exactly. one of them is good. Hamiltonian is good at low temperatures. And this Lagrangian with winding number is good at high temperatures, right? But yeah, one side is different representation yeah. of the same function. Yeah, yeah. 
The left hand side is an information about the Hilbert space and the right hand side is about geodesic lengths in the, in the description, yes. quantum mechanical description. Right. And we know right. these are different concepts. They're different concepts, but you can use of either course. one of them to calculate partition function. Of course. You give the same function. But just... we do not call a state in the Hilbert space something like winding number. Okay, a state in the Hilbert space is a state in the Hilbert space. Well, there are not states in Hilbert space. So these are these, uh, for example, I call them instant on dials, right? Uh, so, we, so there are dials with some winding number. No, the, this formula is between, is for particle on a circle, right? The left hand side is a sum over the states on the Hilbert space and right hand yeah. side is sum over uh, you know, minimal Why geodesic it? paths, yes. geodesic paths. You know, one of them is pet integral description. The other one is the Hilbert space description. Yes. Um, I hate to break this, but this is turning again into discussions uh, rather than uh, okay. short questions. I, so I let's move agree. on and then no, return to this at the end. Uh, I hope it brought some clarity. Yeah, the, everything which you said is, is right. So, so there are two ways of description and there's two ways of description at the end give the same partition function, right? I'm saying, uh, because in QCD, I have only one of them, it's in the classical instant. I try to make, according to uh, Poisson duality, to put it in a different form and interpret it as a sum over some monopoles, which electric charges. And I'm saying uh, that at least this formula tell me that I will never find a semi-classical object, a monopole, because of this action, it doesn't correspond to classical, but it does describe the density of monopoles for the power of log, other than power of temperature. So uh, that corresponds, I repeat, uh, to the fact that latest people find monopoles, they behave like particles, etc. but we never have analytic uh, semi-classical solution of young equation because we don't have uh, a joint uh, scale in this theory. So now, at least to me, it become clear that uh, why we don't have monopole configurations analytically, but still have uh, something which a partition function, which has that mean, and at least describe the incidence. So let me summarize. First of all, I'm telling you that the finite temperature, uh, there is protocol line, and because polycode line takes certain value everywhere in the box, uh, we reformulate instantons and instantons get split into instant ions, NC of them. So in QCD, we have three of them. And out of this three, interestingly enough, only one of them interact with quarks. So if you have ordinary QCD with say two or three flavors of quarks, we have one of them get toft operator, which have four or six fermions, and the other two don't. Now uh, we can do simulation, studying interaction of these objects. Uh, Semi-classical theory of instant ions is much simpler, by the way, than theory of monopoles. Monopoles are particles. You need to do uh, path integral over their trajectories. Instant ions are not particles. They only exist in Euclidean space time and they have collective coordinates only. So it, if we have 300 uh, ions, for example, and each of them have three coordinates, we have something like thousand dimensional ordinary integral, not path integral, which if you compare my results, which I reported to result on the lattice, lattice typically has billion variables. So it's a huge difference. And nevertheless, we see that a huge amount of these variables are not important. And it is this topological object which govern at least for a point of view of phase transitions. Now we can directly see these objects using zero or quasi zero Dirac eigenstates, which show them and we found that not only the number is given by topological charge, their shape is quite accurately equal the uh, what you get if you solve Dirac equation 
in the field of one analytic uh, instant on dying configuration rather than actual QCD vacuum, which these lattices have. So somehow they are not even deformed. They are deformed by each other by uh, proximity of other dyons, but they completely ignore glutes. Now there are in QCD with two flavors and in QCD with three flavors, we get the confinement and chiral transition closed. They both become uh, crossovers. However, we can move them. One deformation is this Polyakov line suppression operator, which people suggested in study on the lattice. And the other is uh, this change of phenionic periodicity, which was proposed by Japanese. And uh, this move either one of the transition in controllable way. Okay, so the fact that uh, close and uh, both uh, crossover can be changed, they can easily change the first order and all moved around. And the last thing is this Poisson duality that this is a general property. The Poisson formula relates one sum to another. This is just mathematical fact, but in physical language, we have two approaches. One of them is Hilbert space and uh, Hamiltonian states, eigenstates, and we have normal partition function with Boltzmann weight. Or we can describe in terms of the paths and winding around Matsubara time, which is different way of explaining. These paths have uh, special paths and classical paths. Uh, and uh, one can write partition function either this way or that way. For many different systems, uh, it needs to have these two circles. So one particle in a circle with Matsubara circle is the simplest example. And where you can sum it and see that you need, you get this way and that way, you get two very different looking sum, summing to the same function. Now uh, in QCD, we only can calculate some classical one with this instant dials. And the monopoles is, uh, you may say, construction of my imagination. I just use Poisson formula backward from it. And instead of proving, I conjecture that this is a monopole partition function. At least one thing it explains. It explains why density of these monopoles or objects are power log of inverse power of log of temperature instead of inverse power of temperature. And it also, of course, if this object uh, are the, the, the monopoles which lattice people observe, they'll explain why we cannot get them analytically from the mix equation. So that's all, guys. And I am more or less exactly an hour. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, a busy and uh, very nice presentation. So I think we can now go to the actual questions. Well, uh, to break the ice, let me start with, uh, okay, uh, Medhar, just give me a second. I'll, I'll ask a very, very simple question first and then we'll go to you. So um, the question is about the, the fact that you could use some deformations of the theory to separate the um, deconfinement and chiral phase transition. Yeah. So um, is this a useful tool to use on the lattice, for example, to probe some um, unusual properties of, of uh, uh, hadrons uh, associated with the anomaly, for example? Um, uh, good question. Uh, of course, if you have the form QCD, you can ask a zillion of questions which you ask about ordinary QCD. All correlation functions, spectrum, uh, with anomaly, no, uh, that. So I simply use it in terms of uh, one quantity, topological susceptibility, which, as you know, related to this uh, eta prime mass, etc. In principle, and of course, uh, chiral symmetry breaking, which we are moving, the, are related to pions and uh, other chiral phenomena. So those are guaranteed to, to change. 
lettuce people have found uh, something which was surprising. So for example, if you take um, SO3 pure gauge theory, the spectrum are blue balls. And you can, they are known on the lattice. You can uh, do this deformation with this parameter small h and move your, uh, conf your confined phase to higher temperature. And then ask a question, what happened with masses of blue balls? They did it, we did it, yes. Well, they find that surprise, although we are still at small at higher temperature, like one and a half TC, for example, uh, but they found that masses of blue balls are kind of staying constant. So as, as far as we are in confined phase, the spectrum more or less stay constant, they say. But that is for blue balls. Blue balls are very heavy, yes? Mm -hmm. So part of what you're asking has been done, but not by us on the latest, yes? We can also try to do that. Uh, yeah, there are many interesting questions. So both the formations, of course, change spectrum, correlation functions, everything, yes? At the moment, we were only interested in location of phase transitions whether we can move phase transitions independently one and the other, yes? And yes, we find we can move them in wide range and even the, the confinement, for example, go from nothing to first order uh, with, with some parameters. So uh, clearly there would be many physical phenomena which are changing. People can study it, we can study it in this form people may study, but it, it is, it, let, let me just emphasize one thing, which is the main thing. So there is lattice. People on the lattice do billion dimensional integral, which cost a lot of money, yes? The, we do thousand dimensional integral. This is uh, 10 minus six of what they're doing. And our 10 minus six, which looks completely buried under the huge pile of other stuff, governing the phase transitions and change them from uh, crossover to first order or move, yes? And all these gluons do nothing to that, yes? Okay. And some little things, which is 10 minus six of the whole action somehow does it, yes? Isn't it amazing? It is amazing, but you wouldn't trust this unless you have the lattice. Yes. The, I compare it that if you have, uh, for example, theory of metals, you can either do a uh, modern version like Fermi liquid with uh, only counting electrons sitting in small region on the Fermi surface, or you do brute force and include all electrons in a piece of metal and calculate path integral for them, yes? We know that 99.9% uh, .9 of them play no role. And only those on, on a Fermi sphere do, yes? Well, for the thermodynamics, it's not completely correct. It may it's be true not. for the transfer, but not- For transfer and for small changes, et cetera, et cetera, yes. But maybe for some transitions or even phases like superconductor or not superconductor. Right. But uh, yeah, of course, yeah, we don't get the overall uh, cardinal plasma equation of state in this way, but we do shift location of transition in agreement with what let us see and what uh, let us. So in that sense, these two deformations are useful because you can do one or the other or both and see how the system responds. And, repeat it on the lattice and see what it does the same. Okay. okay. I, Thank you. That's as good as I can answer. In principle, you can ask very many questions and there would be some answers to it if, if somebody will calculate. Okay. Uh, okay, let's go to Mithat. Uh, so Igor, first uh, to your remark, you know, the fact that Massimo Delia and others saw that the mass indeed remains invariant. And there is, uh, this was actually a prediction by Larry Yaffe and myself from 2007. 
in the large end limit, we prove that in the small circle, small circle theory ca captures uh, the, the dynamics of the large circle theory. And we prove this by using middle Machinko equations. So it was a prediction really. The but other it is thing for is, large n, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it is for large n. large n. Yes, the correction is one over n square. N is equal to three, pure young meals. Okay, that was our prediction. Okay. okay. Maybe. So the thing that I want to say is the following. But it's prediction only in the limit, right? The fact, the fact that at large limit, there is correction one over n squared does yes. not guarantee that when n is two, uh, it sure. is a good prediction. Sure, sure, but it is still good prediction. The, the, the only thing- For some I quantities it is good, for some quantities no. Um, he, he, here is what I want to say, Edward. So, and I want to say in the most polite way possible, okay? I, I am not talking on my behalf, but, but I have collaborators too, you know, Larry Affe, Eric Popitz, uh, Schiffman, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe we were the first one who did reliable semi-classics on R3 cross S1 in 2007. And I am well, not saying that okay. you mention us, okay? I am not saying that. Yeah, but well, in the, what, what do you call, but, I'm sorry, I, I, I wanted to be maximally polite, but let me also say, you go to the most trivial case when, when Toft operator is Q bar Q. And, and, or in other language, to, you only consider cases, what you call reliable, which means that density- Reliable is means that there is an small. effective field theory, there is a separation of scales. There is right. no- but, but you are not able to do anyone. So for example, uh, you can only consider tiny, tiny fraction when uh, Toft operator is big B fermionic. As soon okay. as it is not, you are done. We can, we can anyways, okay, maybe we can leave this aside. Uh, any other questions, gentlemen? Okay. And we will continue with this one just in, in, in one I second. Short, just... uh, I have a short question. Okay, go uh, ahead, please, yeah, Giorgio. Yeah. Yeah, just as a qualitatively, is there an explanation what happens with Kasher's argument when the uh, two phase transitions get separated? Uh, that's a good question. I don't really, uh, th there is no question in my mind that these two can be separated. We have two different deformations and they move two different ones in two different directions. So at least in the form QCD, we can separate them. Why in a real QCD without this deformation, they are sitting more or less at the same place? I cannot tell you. But philosophically speaking, is it possible that they are separated? Yes, they can be separated. That's why these deformations are important. Uh, I'm not sure, Giorgio, is this exactly what you asked? Yeah. It kind of, a, just, just as a, just sort of as a, as a clarification um, for people who might not know, Kasher's argument basically says that if you put fermions in a potential well, um, you get a Carl, you get a breaking of Carl symmetry, you get Psi L Psi R, which is the inverse of the potential well. So if you kind of have well-defined quasi Quasi particles and semi classical approximations. This is a very quality, it's something I can explain to anyone type thing. But I and think this model is I also very qualitative. Huh? I think it's a wrong argument because you can make a potential well out of vector field and out of scalar field. If you make it out of vector field, the chirality doesn't change. And so it has nothing to do with uh, chiral transition. We, we can, if, if you make a scalar field, then scattering on a scalar, you change chirality. But who knows what, what is that potential there? Yes? So it, it tell you something. So if you have quarkonium, for example, people were arguing whether linear potential is scalar 
or the actor, the, the confining potential. Yes? That is the same issue, yes? Whether each scattering uh, flight quark will flip correlity or not flip correlity. In, in terms of this topological object, which I'm discussing, instantons and instant ions, uh, the situation is clearly not the same. So for example, I have NC of these objects, all of them have interaction with Polyakov line and they affect Polyakov line and affect the confine, yes? And only those of them who have zero modes affect chiral transition, which is one of them, if you have fermions, yes? So you see there are these objects, object on one hand interact with polycovo line and with the confinement. On the other hand, only one of them, and this topology requires that only one of them, they have fractional topological charge, and yet only one of them have topological zero modes of fermions. And so only these guys are responsible for chiral transition and everything, and other guys are not. So uh, after you start dealing with this uh, dynamics, you understand that two issues are not related that close as, as, as we thought some years ago. Okay. I think that that clarifies a little bit better, right? Maybe, maybe I, uh, my, one more little clarification. So if you have, you write the Dirac equation in the field of any of this object, and it has a solution. It always has a solution, and it's more or less the same solution. The subtlety is that n minus one of them have non-normalizable zero and one of them has normalizable, and only normalizable is acceptable, yes? So th this is, uh, so the chiral physics is much more subtle than just the confined, <laughs> I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, it's probably yeah. fair. Yeah. Anyway, any other questions before we continue on officially a little bit longer after that? I don't see any other questions. So uh, let me use this opportunity and first uh, thank Edward for agreeing to talk and giving this presentation.